Uh, so uh, thanks to everyone for joining. Thanks to uh, people joining us from various different campuses, wherever you're based, uh, joining us from home and uh, perhaps those watching later as well, uh, asynchronously, as, as we would say. Uh, for those who don't know me, my name is uh, Garodo Suluan. Uh, I'm the head of the Department of uh, Technology Enhanced Learning, uh, based here uh, in uh, MTU Cork on the Bishopstown campus. Uh, so uh, today's session, as, uh, as advertised, is all about current and uh, future trends in, uh, in EdTech. Uh, we're going to hear from a number of different speakers, each uh, speaker in turn is going to take a particular trend, uh, offer um, some bit of a definition on it, talk about some developments in that area, and uh, then talk about how it might land, as it were, here in MTU or in the sector uh, in general, okay? Um, I think we should be finished by maybe 1.40 or something like that, so uh, there will be some time for questions. Uh, there is a button on the bottom of the screen, uh, uh, the Q&A uh, button. And if you click on that, you can, um, you can put in some questions for us to get back to you on uh, now or, or later. Uh, right now, though, I'm going to do just a little bit of, a, of an overview and uh, offer some uh, introductory um, remarks, okay? So I'm going to sort of talk simultaneously. I'll just get my, my slides up here. So I'm going to talk simultaneously uh, a little bit using this diagram here about what we do in the Department of Technology Enhanced Learning, and I suppose how we understand the whole field of technology enhanced learning or, or ed tech, um, if you like, okay? So kind of at the top of the diagram there, um, there's a reference to internal services and supports. And just kind of to the right of that, a mention of here and now technologies. So even before COVID and emergency remote teaching came along, um, there was a whole range of things that we had been doing uh, in the mainstream. So I suppose we um, manage, you know, um, uh, an e-learning or ed tech uh, infrastructure that includes things you're all now familiar with, like Canvas and Zoom and, uh, and so forth. Uh, we would also uh, manage and support a whole suite of uh, fully online programs, as well as uh, encouraging and providing support for the use of uh, ed tech as, as a complement to um, on-campus programs and to other on campus teaching and learning um, activities. Okay, so all of that is kind of covered in the internal services and supports there. And, and in a way, I suppose the only change which emerged with, with emergency remote teaching, I'll be talking towards the end of today's session about uh, emergency remote teaching, but the only change really, in a sense, was related to scale, you know. So we sometimes refer to emergency remote teaching as the great onlining. So it's not great in terms of it necessarily have, having been, you know, fantastic or top rate, but uh, great in the sense of having had massive scale, if you like. But I'll, I'll return to that point. At the, at the bottom of the graphic there, you can see exploratory research. So there's always a next big thing coming along in this uh, space where uh, technology meets learning, okay? And it's important uh, work uh, strategically uh, to be research active, to be engaging with the various new uh, trends that are, that are coming along, you know? So you'll be hearing today, as, as you'll have read about things like game-based learning and learning analytics and, um, personalized learning and uh, micro-credentials and, and so on. So we're actively engaged in all of those areas, as is the world of ed tech itself, as it continues, I suppose, in a sense, to, to trial 
and to pilot and to consider and evaluate these various different uh, trends uh, as they as they come along. Um, I would ju just as a kind of a footnote or, or a sidebar like to say that even though a lot of these trends will end up sounding uh, like technology or technology led or technology centric trends, um, in fact, the pedagogy is just as important because what we're talking about is using technology to help learning happen, to support learners, to, uh, to better uh, capture learning. And to do that, we need to understand how learning happens. We need the, the pedagogy as well. So the two things are inextricably linked, if you like. Now, one feature of the diagram here, as you may have been anticipating, uh, is that it's, it's a virtuous circle. So the exploratory research feeds into the mainstream and eventually becomes part of the kind of internal services and supports that, that are offered by a department like ours, let's say, okay? Um, so it ensures the currency of the provision, the exploratory research work does, and future-proofs things, uh, if you like. But in turn, the internal services and supports, as per the diagram, um, they bring a certain realism to the exploratory research that's uh, conducted. They bring end user insights. They give us a sense, or it gives us a sense, working in the mainstream gives us a sense of the kinds of problems that people are trying to navigate and trying to, uh, to grapple with. Now, like all diagrams, this is a bit of a simplification. It's a bit of a, a leaky model, if you like. So some of the trends we're talking about, you could say, are already in the mainstream or maybe some early incarnation of them is, is in the mainstream. So learning analytics is with us already, but um, um, it still continues to be a trend, if you like, from which new things are coming and, and, and um, from which new practices and new things in the mainstream uh, are, are coming, if you like. So I'm hoping this might be a kind of a useful way to think about some of what you'll be hearing about today uh, as a way to kind of contextualize also some of the conversations about the likely future of ed tech, but also as a way maybe to uh, think about the legacy of emergency remote teaching, which is a point uh, that I will be returning to. Uh, but right now, I would like to switch over to uh, MC mode and introduce uh, our first speaker and our, and our first topic. So um, talking about a topic very close to my own heart and uh, research interests is Dara Coakley. So Dara, I'm gonna stop sharing the screen here if that's okay, and hand over to you for a few minutes. Okay, thanks very much, Garod, and hello, everyone. So I'm just going to talk a bit about game-based learning and gamification. Um, I suppose a good place to begin is when we talk about game-based learning, what we're talking about really is the, um, the use of games as a teaching tool to facilitate teaching and learning, and in that, the learning activities in the learning information in here within the game itself. And when we talk about gamification, that's referring to the integration of common game features and mechanics, leaderboard, leaderboards, badges, awards, points into traditional learning activities. And we in the department have a long history of research and development in both those areas. So in terms of our game-based learning activities, um, the games we typically develop would be aimed at raising awareness uh, or about or teaching about important social causes, or as we call them, games for good. So one such game is Penji Protects the Planet, which was a game developed to teach primary school and secondary school kids about sustainability and climate action. And that was a game that was highlighted by the EU Commission and the Irish National Agency as kind of a project success story. Another environmental game that we would have developed was the Green Hipster Hotel, and that was used to teach students in the tourism and hospitality sector about food waste, water management, energy management in the tourism industry. And both Penji and that game were developed with our colleagues here in MTU Cork in a CTC. And a more recent game, which was developed includes um, CyberPro, which is a game aimed at teaching girls in secondary schools uh, about careers that will be available to them in the area of cybersecurity. 
from a gamification point of view, there's a huge number of different approaches and elements that can be applied, like formative challenges, awards, competitive systems, like leaderboards. But one area of gamification the department has long been involved in is the development and provision of digital badges, which ties into what my colleague Tig will be talking about in terms of micro-credentials. In terms of the future, we can look to the growth of the game industry, the growth of areas like esports, just the general popularity of digital games to see the likely trajectory for this kind of area. And within this context, the use of games for learning and games for good will continue to be a key area exploited within and without MTU. So um, that is it from me. Um, our colleague Tig, I believe, has a video, which is it okay for me to uh, share that now, Gerard? Absolutely, please, 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 Dara. So, uh, Tig is actually at another event today, but he's, uh, as Dara says, he's pre-recorded something for us on the, on the whole subject of micro credentials. So, if you can play, that'd be great, Dara. Thanks. Hello, my name is Tig Lean, and I'm a senior lecturer in the Tel department. I want to talk to you about micro credentials, which are of specific interest to us in the Tel department, but which we also expect will increasingly be of strategic interest to the university and the broader higher education sector. The term micro-credentials is used to describe a broad range of educational offerings which fall outside of the familiar major awards such as degrees, higher diplomas and the like. The micro-credential label describes everything from the minor awards such as those offered under the Springboard program as well as much smaller units of learning, the equivalent of a single module or less. You will no doubt have heard terms such as special purpose award, digital badge and single subject certification. All of these are included under the micro credentials label. Micro credentials offer a number of benefits. One benefit, which is often cited, is referred to as stackability. And this describes where micro-credentials can be combined or stacked and then used towards the achievement of a major award. But micro-credentials have benefits in their own right also. For example, they provide a formal means of recognizing learning or skills which have been acquired and which may be of value in an individual's curriculum vitae. Micro-credentials also provide a low stakes or low cost first step in an individual's learning journey. And as such, they can provide a means by which an individual can engage or re-engage with formal education. To make micro-credentials a reality and to realize the intended benefit, requires a platform or, or a facility which firstly allows the learning to be acquired and recognized, which may include elements of academic delivery, assessment and quality assurance. Secondly, allows the learner to record that the credentials have been achieved. And finally, allows the learner to present or communicate the relevant credentials to employers, education institutions, and other interested parties. In the TEL department, our interest is in the development of suitable pedagogical and academic modalities, enabled and enhanced by technology, which make micro-credentials a real and significant part of the university's future offerings. Our hope is that MTU will be a leader nationally and internationally in the development of best practice in respect of micro-credentials. Okay, uh, so we're off to a flying start already with two big uh, trends already having been covered. So thanks to Dara um, for, for his presentation, but also for all the great work he's done over the years in terms of leading out on a lot of those projects that he uh, quickly shared and uh, thanks to, to Tig for his uh, his pre-recorded presentation there. There is, as people might be aware, a lot of activity in that whole area of micro-credentials at the moment in both practice and policy, uh, particularly uh, in Ireland at the moment, uh, a lot of it being uh, linked up with a lot of HCI uh, funded uh, initiatives that are currently uh, ongoing. 
Uh, next up, though, we have, I think, Rojin Garvey, who's going to talk about open educational resources. It's another uh, huge field, really, that's really blown up, I think, during COVID, in part because people were um, creating so much digital content and maybe looking for ways to reuse and remix stuff that was out there already. But of course, as we'll hear, there's a lot more to it than that. So over to you, uh, Rojin, if you're happy to come in at this stage. Sure. Thanks, Garoj. Um, hi, everyone. I'll just share my uh, my video there for a second. I've uh, Technology has failed me today, so uh, my connection is, is a little bit poor. Uh, so I'm uh, Roshin Garvey, learning technologist in, in the department. Um, so I'm just going to be talking a bit about um, OERs, or Open Educational Resources. So uh, these are teaching, uh, learning or research materials that are freely available within the public domain and can be adapted, reused or distributed um, under specific conditions through something like Creative Commons licensing. Uh, this isn't an exhaustive list by any means, but so, some examples of, of OER material for higher education can include things like rich media, like videos, animations, slide decks, images, uh, quiz banks, simulations and even uh, full online courses. OER repositories um, provide a, a dedicated space to share and search for these resources and many educators also share material directly with their own local communities, so within their university or, or um, institute or to, to a, a larger audience online. Um, the OER Commons is, is a quite well-known repository and the, the newly launched National Resource Hub from the National Forum for the Enhancement of Teaching and Learning aims to provide a collection of OERs for the Irish higher education sector. Uh, Canvas or VLE has the, has the Canvas Commons and free online courses are provided by the likes of the Open University through Open Learn and MIT's uh, Open Courseware. So over the years, uh, the TEL department has de developed a variety of OERs, and I'm just going to give a few quick examples here. Uh, TEL Tools um, is, a, is a collection of free online micro learning courses designed to help educators use technology in their teaching and learning. Uh, most recently, the department has advised on and designed and developed infographics and animations for the National Forum's launch to support open education through their National Resource Hub. And uh, the department has also recently completed instructional design and develop, development on the MTU Library Assignment Toolkit, a resource offering students information on academic integrity, research practices and academic writing. OERs have great value for sharing knowledge within the learning community and for allowing users to supplement their existing teaching and learning activities. They can also provide equitable access to a broader range of learning materials for students. OERs appear regularly in annual EdTech trend reports and policies, but awareness and use of the resources still remain somewhat low. Uh, while many understandably didn't have time during this emergency remote teaching period to add other elements to their classes, there has at least been an increased awareness in OERs through local and national initiatives which aim to reduce some barriers by helping people to identify quality resources and uh, to speed up the time required uh, for, for sourcing these materials. I'm just going to pass you back to, to Garo there now. That's great. Thanks, Rogine, and thanks for all your work on those projects. It's uh, great to have been able to work with the with the National Forum on some of those initiatives uh, that, you, that you've been talking about. I see, by the way, that uh, Dr. Tom Farley from uh, our Kerry campus is uh, on the call as well. And I, I would just like to acknowledge that he's done a lot of work and published a number of uh, articles in, in this area as well. So um, thanks again, Rogine. Delighted for the department to have been involved in all of that work. So next up, we have a relatively new member of staff, uh, Niall Fahey, who's going to take on the whole area of learning analytics, which brings such promise with it in, in terms of the kind of insights that it can give us into the student journey and into the, the student experience. So if you think back to the diagram I shared earlier, it is in a sense a here and now technology, but in another way as well, it is one that's just getting started. So over to you, Niall, if that's okay. Yeah, thank you very much. I'm just gonna share my screen there now. Okay, look. 
So I uh, so my own name is Lefay and I'm a I'm an e-learning technical officer as well in the department and I'm just going to be chatting about learning analytics. So I suppose first things is definition. Uh, really, what it's really about is it's it's taking the data that students are producing, it's mining that data to understand and create insights or to, that can optimize their learning, their learning skills, and the actual environment that their their learning takes uh, place in. In terms of levels of application in learning analytics, it's, it's the three areas. There's descriptive, predictive, and prescriptive. Descriptive is what one that you would all be probably relatively aware of. And that's typical things like, you know, dashboards that give you an understanding of what is happening and what has happened, and maybe in a course or module. And then the real next step ones then are the kind of predictive analytics where you're taking prior data, you're using that then to formulate models or algorithms that can identify relationships between particular data points and then your course outcomes. So then you're putting your you're running students uh, live data through this and then you know systems that you can integrate then would flag uh, notifications to you saying you know maybe that a particular student at this moment in time is struggling they may need additional support uh, and, and things like that prescriptive analytics then they use historical actions of students on a particular module or course and they provide evidence-based recommendations then that are customized to that specific student uh, to, you know, based on their uh, understanding of the topic and their overall performance. So examples of this, we kind of adaptive learning environments like Area 9 or Smart Sparrow, whereby the student goes through it as they're progressing through the course. The system is, is analyzing all the data that they're inputting and their progress, and it's suggesting the route that they take through the, the, the module. Maybe they need to focus more on a particular topic because they're not quite at the level yet of understanding, or they have a good understanding and they can actually jump ahead in some of the content. A good uh, resource uh, locally is from the National Forum. If you're if you're interested for the for it's an online resource for learning analytics. There's a lot of information there, and I would definitely recommend checking that out. In terms of our own department, then I suppose Red Ink was a was a really good uh, app that was development developed internally, and it was a digital tool for meaningful assessment that allowed users to run queries, reports, and develop visualized data patterns. So the real benefit here, then I suppose, is that. We have inbuilt some learning analytics in that that would allow the instructor to determine areas of assessment that need more targeted learning uh, material or support on for students based on the actual outcome of assessments they've assigned previously. Looking to the future, I suppose learning analytics can inform future course development, help identify st uh, students who are not progressing as they as, as you wish, improve their, their, their engagement and build stronger learning skills actually in our learners. It could also allow for the real time uh, testing of pedagogical approaches and allow for a move towards more a more evidence based uh, decision making. So that's it for me. Thank you. Great, Niall. Uh, thanks. Uh, thanks. Thanks very much. So, as I say, it, it's um, Something, and as you've said as well, Niall, it's a, it's a trend that's kind of in the mainstream already, but in a sense, just getting started, particularly as we move towards more predictive learning analytics and more prescriptive learning analytics. So um, very interesting one there. Thanks for that. Uh, next up, we have Brendan Flaherty, who uh, um, is our newest member of staff, but before Brendan joined us, he worked at uh, an international automation company, and some of his work there involved working on VR and AR apps for training, which is our next trend, the use of VR, AR, or XR, if you prefer, for, uh, for learning purposes. So, Brendan, if you're okay to come in, we might, uh, we might hand over to you there. Cheers. Thanks, Gerard. I'll just uh, share my screen there. So, yeah, you can see my screen. Yep. Uh, so, as Gerard was saying, my name is Brendan Flaherty and I'm e-learning technical officer in the TEL department. And I suppose what I want to talk to today is about augmented reality and virtual reality development in EdTech. So, um, so yeah, augmented reality or AR is a short term for it, layers information over physical spaces and objects through the use of mobile or wearable devices and where virtual reality or VR immerses the user in a simulation. AR and VR are used to enhance learning and are ex excellent tools to help improve students' understandings of complex topics and also gives them the ability to learn about inaccessible processes. So in the world of ed tech, AR and VR are used across multiple disciplines. 
VR has been used to allow students to participate in virtual clinical trials in an exercise physiology simulation and also allows students in medicine to get a better understanding of human anatomy through simulation and models. Um, in STEM subjects, a hands-on collaborative lab using AR technology has been created to allow students to experiment with different chemical reactions and creating a kind of safe area. Uh, in arts and drama departments, the AR show platform is being used to add augmented reality elements to live performance. Um, so examples in uh, the tell department that we've been working on. So uh, Digital Treasures is a collaborative project with seven partners from seven different company, countries and co-funded by the EU, uh, where we tasked to create interactive exhibitions across multiple countries using archival items. Uh, we are able to use augmented reality to overlay an extra layer of information on exhibition documents that are hundreds of years old and it allowed the audience to interact by scanning the document using their mobile devices. So the use of AR and VR, you know, to wrap up, the use of AR and VR in education is, is an excellent and fun way to enhance, in, enhance learning. From immersion to gamification, these technologies can elevate traditional teaching to deliver better student experience and it might be the missing ingredient to producing the sustainable hybrid education model. Um, let's just stop sharing there and hand back to Garrod, if that's okay. That's perfect. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Brendan. So, you know, there, there's a lot of here and now stuff as well, I guess, associated with VR and, uh, and AR. It's not clear, though, exactly how it's going to land um, in the mainstream. Uh, I would say that um, one of the things with it, I suppose, is that it's about the erosion or the blurring of the distinction between, you know, the virtual and the real, you know. So we um, are seeing the virtual becoming more real in one sense, becoming more high fidelity. And we're also seeing uh, the real becoming augmented in a digital way. So I think this maybe augurs a time when, when as I say, that the you know the boundary between those two things is uh, is going to become uh, more blurred. Um, I could talk about uh, Facebook's uh, metaverse or something like that, but uh, we're going to continue our whistle stop tour. Uh, last um, trend of all, actually, uh, is uh, self directed or self paced learning, and uh, talking to you about that will be our own Shane Cronin. So over to you, Shane, if that's okay. Yeah. Hi, Gerard. Hi, everybody. Um, uh, my name is Shane Cronin, and I'm the Senior Learning Technologist here in the Department of Technology and Enhanced Learning. And I'm just going to talk to you today about um, the subject of self-paced um, learning. So if you just bear with me a sec. Um, so self-paced learning really is about kind of giving control back to the learners. Um, it refers to the way that we allow students to customize their own learning experience and their learning environment. And uh, that kind of just fits their own needs over time. So we're all aware that, you know, live has been a very big uh, component of um, the last couple of years. Um, but asynchronous learning um, and self-paced learning uh, really offer students the uh, ability to have a more flexible schedule and typically uses a variety of channels, including uh, things like pre-recorded videos um, and more kind of sculpted um, e-learning content and interactions. So it's gaining a lot of momentum at the moment because there's a lot of talk about putting the learner back into their, the center of their own educational journey and in a funny way it ties in with a lot of the themes as well that we've talked about including micro credentials and other things like that where you know we're leaving it up to the student uh, to look at you know these new technologies that they can use including um, you know content curation engines uh, learning resource stores where you can you know pool from a lot of different activities that you have across different platforms and the main advantages of self-paced would be the fact that you have on-demand access to your course materials you can engage learners obviously in different locations and time zones and i suppose 
uh, you know, the biggest advantage really to self-paced is that um, we as educators uh, can create resources that help students to understand fundamental problems before they come to class. Now, we're all aware probably of the big players in terms of self-paced. They would include um, LinkedIn Learning, formerly Linda and uh, Future Learn, for example. And then I suppose in terms of maybe more homegrown projects, uh, we in the TEL department would have um, developed commercial e-learning resources, self-paced resources for companies such as Vodafone, Postbank, Citigroup, Baxter Healthcare, and they would involve, um, you know, basically creating these self-paced resources that students can use, take at their own time and, and then, you know, reserve other time for sort of live sessions or, or classes. Also, a bit more close to home is the Cyber Skills Project. So that's a, an ongoing project where we're involved in developing media-rich, uh, self-paced e-learning resources. Um, again, with the view of covering more fundamental and theory-based, um, I suppose, subject matter, um, and having um, you know e-learning interactions, activities that check their knowledge, and then allow them to bring questions to 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 the the class time. And uh, again, more closely to home is uh, our, our resources such as the uh, Return to Campus course here in, in, in MTU Cork, where students basically take a course uh, and uh, before they actually come back onto campus. Um, so really in terms of how this will land and how it maybe is already landing is is a move maybe to maybe beyond the live, which is running really well already, as we know, and there's a lot of Zoom stuff happening and there's a lot of really good live stuff happening online, but it's a move maybe to more a multi-format learning content strategy. And as I said a while ago, you could look at things like content curation engines, at the use of AI for personalized learning paths, and also looking at more modern education technologies such as uh, learning tools, interoperability standards, LTI or XAPI to get valuable insights into how content is being used and to drive relevant content delivery. So that's uh, me, Garoda. I might hand it back over to you there. That's great, Shane. Uh, thanks. Uh, thanks very much. Sorry, just getting my my video uh, going there. So thanks, Shane, for that for that presentation, and for all the work over the years, um, uh, in in terms of those uh, projects and developments, much of which you uh, you coordinated and directed. So, folks, it's uh, just a little bit after half past. We've reached the end of our trends. I hope people have. Uh, found that uh, an interesting and engaging and uh, and motivating account of things in terms of maybe people wanting to find out more about these things and get involved in, in, in a bit more. I'm just going to share my screen again and just offer maybe a few final reflections. So I hope that's sharing again there. You should be seeing that virtuous uh, circle that, that I shared um, earlier on. So I'm going to offer maybe one last definition, uh, one last trend, one last definition here for emergency remote teaching or ERT. So not really what you might think of as a cutting edge uh, trend, uh, certainly not as I've defined it here, which is as a range of online approaches for teaching and learning that would, that would otherwise, it would usually have taken place in a traditional face-to-face -face, uh, format. Now, because of its emergency nature, I suppose, emergency remote teaching was very much based on the here and now technologies at the top of that diagram there. Um, in some ways, and partly maybe for that reason, the field of ed tech itself, I think, was often not sure what to make of emergency uh, remote teaching. You know, people in the field were often quite keen, I think, to point out that emergency remote teaching fell short of what you might call proper online learning, um, which, as they would say, is much, you know, better planned and uh, better resourced and better uh, supported. But I do think just just by way of conclusion that um, that kind of criticism can blind us to what was achieved with emergency remote teaching and what was really unique and kind of radical about it, basically. So 
for whatever faults and imperfections it might have, it kept the show on the road, uh, number one, but also unlike previous other ed tech developments, it included everybody. So everybody got involved, everybody took part. And I think in the end, maybe that's its most unprecedented and, uh, and radical um, aspect, if you like. It wasn't limited to the enthusiastic few. All teaching moved to the online environment and all uh, third level lectures became online lectures, you know. So what will be, in the context we've just, you know, heard about here, what will be the lasting legacy or the lasting implications of this kind of um, scale and, and take up? Well, I think most third level staff, for one thing, will emerge from this period with a whole new repertoire of, uh, of skills. Uh, many of them uh, will have not only developed collections of reusable digital uh, learning materials, but will also have figured out new ways of teaching their subjects uh, online. And obviously staff and students alike, because we are still doing emergency uh, remote teaching, will have had an extended experience of teaching and learning at a distance, you know. So in many cases as well, it's worth saying, it was actually quite a good experience, you know. So in May this year, as many of you may know, we surveyed staff and students, again, doing some of this with the help of Tom Farley uh, from the Kerry campus, who's, who's on the call. Uh, but we surveyed staff and students in the Munster Technological University about their experiences of emergency remote teaching. And we discovered that a large majority of uh, staff and students, for example, felt that emergency remote teaching had clear benefits. So here are the results from, from staff, for example, uh, who felt 81 point or 80.1% 80 of them felt there were benefits associated with remote uh, teaching and learning. And neither staff uh, or students um, uh, felt um, or, or were universally or 100% in favor of a return to traditional pre-COVID modes of online teaching and learning. Yeah, so only 26.5% of students, and as you see here, only 20.8% of staff uh, looked for a return to traditional pre-COVID on-campus uh, teaching and learning, you know, so I think that certainly gives the lie, if you like, to the notion um, that everybody was opposed to emergency remote teaching or that it was universally uh, reviled, if you like. So I think um, experiences of emergency remote teaching, now that we're finally, let's hope, uh, turning the corner on, uh, on COVID and the various different uh, health restrictions associated with it, but those experiences should open the way, I hope, um, for bigger and more inclusive conversations about the future of higher education, the role ed tech has to play in that, about how learning happens, about how uh, learners are uh, best uh, supported. And uh, coming back to today's sessions, what trends the university should concentrate its efforts on, that it should explore and pilot with a view uh, to, to mainstreaming. If that's of interest, if you would like to join us on this journey, become involved maybe in some of the piloting or in uh, some of the research or thinking about these things, do please reach out and uh, make contact. Um, I think we have a few uh, minutes left, maybe for a question or two. But before uh, handing over, I would uh, like to offer my thanks to everybody who spoke today, obviously, to uh, all of you who have attended and might be watching afterwards. And in particular, uh, to uh, Shane Cronin, uh, Dara Coakley, uh, Brendan Flaherty for their work in very quickly putting together this uh, 
the, the, this whole event. I think we only thought of it on Tuesday. Um, and also to Christina Pinko, who did uh, some of the nice graphic work uh, that you've been able to see uh, in the slides here.